now have uh, VLAP data, chloride data on VLAP lakes for 43 lakes that have 10 or more years uh, worth of continuous chloride data. And what we found, and this really wasn't that surprising to us and may not be surprising to you as well, but of those 43 lakes, 33 of them had a significantly increasing trend. So that's about 70, 77% of the water bodies that we're able to do this analysis on. And not only that, but when we looked at the beginning uh, of when this uh, trend uh, analysis started to the end, the increase in chloride concentration was about 55%. So it's not small. It, it is uh, increasing gradually over time, and we're really noticing it now. One thing I'd like to point out is that when we measure uh, chloride, we compare that to our water quality standards in the state, the criteria. And the current criteria is 230 milligrams per liter. Um, most of our water bodies don't reach, in fact, our lakes and ponds, most of them don't reach that level. But what we found out is that this criteria is actually probably pretty high for seeing impacts on aquatic life. Um, it's quite likely that this criteria will be revised lower in the years to come. So that may result in some additional impairments. What I thought I'd do is just give you a, a quick idea of what those, uh, a couple of examples of what those results look like from the trend analysis. And here's Canopy Lake down um, in Salem, New Hampshire. And this is one of the lakes that has a relatively high chloride concentration. And what you see is going back to 2010 chloride concentrations of about um, 60 uh, milligrams per liter and uh, now increasing up to around 100 milligrams per liter. So it's again, it's not near that 230, but it is a pretty significant increase. And it's not just lakes like Canopy Lake that are in developed areas of the state, but here's Ayers Pond, which is over in Barrington, New Hampshire. And if you look over on the left hand side, you see the chloride concentration back in 2010 was about 15 milligrams per liter. Well, that's quite a bit lower than Canopy Lake, but the increase looks almost the same. And in fact, now it's it's doubled to about 30 milligrams per liter. So it's it's not um, restricted to any particular water body. Water bodies that have roads running by them, have development around them, they all are seeing this very similar increase in chloride concentrations. One of the things that we like to do is uh, compare the data to make sure that we're seeing the trends that we think we're seeing. And another way to look at chloride is through measures of specific conductance. And that's a that's a parameter that VLAP has been monitoring for a lot longer than chloride. <clears throat> so a couple of years ago, we issued our lakes trend report, which looked at the uh, trends in specific conductance. And that's very similar to chloride. They're, they're closely correlated because when salt is added to to water, the, the ions, sodium and chloride, uh, dissociate and specific conductance is a measure of the dissolved ions in the water bodies. So here what you're seeing is those trend analyses that were done on specific conductance for our Lake Trends report. And over on the left hand side, you can see the trophic class. This is the, the measure of productivity in a particular lake and the different VLAP lakes that are in each of these trophic classes. And what you see if we look at the number of water bodies that had increasing trends was out of 150 water bodies that were analyzed for their trends in specific conductance, 62% of them, or 62 of the lakes, I'm sorry, had increasing trends, and that's about 40%. So that sort of confirms the same trends that we're seeing in chloride. So. It is a pretty consistent trend that we're seeing in many of our water bodies around the state. So clearly we have a problem. We have a problem with salt, um, not just because we eat a lot of potato chips, but because we apply a lot of road salt. But there's things that we can do to be part of these, the solution here. One of the things you can do is obviously apply less salt. So when you're out uh, taking care of your driveway in the winter time, Try to use less salt, apply less fertilizer. Those also have salts in them. Manage your storm water, whether that's just controlling where it goes or the amount of storm water that you're creating. 
And then lastly, one of the things that we've been working very hard at uh, DES recently is to get uh, landscapers, people that apply salt, is to become certified salt applicators. So if you're having a plow service, take care of your driveway or parking lot in the winter time. When you decide to go ahead and hire one, ask them if they're a, uh, an NHDES certified salt applicator and try to try to select ones that are. Um, these people have gone through classes and learned how to apply salt and how much salt to apply and how to keep track of their equipment and maintain their equipment. All right, so moving on to a project that we worked on last year on Nipple Lake in Barrington. It was a, uh, a fairly significant rest lake restoration project, one that we really haven't done since uh, in the mid 80s, and that was on Kizar Lake. And this included the addition of aluminum compounds to the lake, chemicals to the lake, in order to control cyanobacteria blooms. The, the, uh, the compounds that we added were aluminum sulfate and sodium aluminate, and we actually added about 130,000 liters. Yes, that's a lot to this lake. Um, the reason was, was we wanted to control these repetitive cyanobacteria blooms. Nippo Lake had experienced uh, cyanobacteria blooms dating back to 2010 and had those pretty much annually every year. Um, it would, again, as I mentioned, it's the first time we used these compounds or this type of treatment since 1984. And we only did it after Nippo Lake had completed a watershed based management plan. And they did their best efforts to control any external sources of nutrients. Um, it was it was a gigantic uh, project, and oh, a lot of thanks and uh, yeah, just a lot of thanks to the Nipple Lakes Association who've been working on this for many many years. How does the how do these chemicals work? Basically, they bind. Um, they bind phosphorus to the bottom sediments. What we found in Nippo Lake was that the amount of phosphorus in the lower layers of the lake, what you guys probably know as a hypolimnion, were, was extremely high. The, uh, the release of the, the phosphorus from the bottom sediments was promoted by low dissolved oxygen. And those nutrients would build up in this bottom layer over the summer. And then when the lake turned over in the fall, they would mix and allow all the nutrients to be released into the water column. And that was just providing a massive amount of nutrient loading to the lake. What's unique about aluminum is that it will continue to bind those phosphorus compounds to the bottom sediments, even when low dissolved oxygen is in place. So that was the the uh, the bonus of using aluminum compounds and we do have some very encouraging preliminary results um, secchi disc which you guys measure regularly is a measure of the water transparency increased from about five to ten meters and i know what everybody's thinking is they want a secchi disc of 10 meters we're not sure if that's going to continue um, but we're hopeful that it will be better than it was in the past Additionally, uh, one way to keep track of the amount of algae or cyanobacteria in the water body is to uh, complete a measure of chlorophyll A, which you guys also do regularly. Those levels, concentrations remain below three micrograms per liter last year. And then lastly, the, the ultimate rubber hits the road part of the project was looking at those phosphorus concentrations. In the past, phosphorus concentrations in the upper layers of Nippo Lake were about 10 micrograms per liter. Last year, after using aluminum compounds, concentrations in those upper layers were five micrograms per liter. More importantly, those lower layers, which I talked about where there was a very high concentration of total phosphorus, about 90 micrograms per liter on average, only measured 20 micrograms per liter. So the early results are very encouraging from this project. It's not a project that I would recommend for every lake it's very expensive to do and it required that completion of the watershed base plan and the elimination of external sources of phosphorus really to make it successful we're going to continue monitoring nipple lake this summer and in probably many summers to come the hope is that this treatment using these aluminum compounds will last for 15 or 20 years 
So we're, we're very encouraged by these early results. There's a nice picture of the aluminum compounds being added to the lake. Next, I want to shift to um, a recent study that was just completed and report issued in February 2022, and that's what we're calling our lake probability study. And we call it probability because the lakes that were selected, which are shown on this map here on the right hand side, were selected completely at random. And this is a project we did in conjunction with a national project at EPA. And the idea behind doing a random selection is sort of like a political poll well, where they will randomly call people and ask their opinion about something and then be able to make an estimate about the entire population. And that's exactly what this project was meant to do. We had 50 lakes that were sampled over the course of a couple of years, and then we're able to extrapolate those results to all of our lakes and ponds in New Hampshire. The data was really used to make uh, assessments on both primary and secondary contact um, recreation, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but primary contact recreation is the actual swimming, you're contacting the water, um, secondary contact recreation, just an example, might be paddling. We also use the data to estimate how um, how well the lake was doing with respect to its ability to support aquatic life use. The other thing that we wanted to use this, these data for was to compare outcomes to what other lakes in the region and national uh, conditions were. And that's a question that we get often is well this is what my lake is or this is what the lakes are in new hampshire but how does that compare to other lakes um, across the country so we're able to do that with these results as well the important thing to recognize about a study like this is that it represents all of new hampshire lakes and ponds and for this particular study all the lakes were over one hectare However, the results from any individual lake is not really sufficient enough to con make any conclusions on the um, on the condition of that particular water body. And on the bottom here, and I know Sarah is recording this, um, is a link to that report, and I would highly suggest you go ahead and take a look at that. And for all the reports that we published uh, recently, there's also a nice summary of that report. So if you want to wade through a 30 page report, you can read the summary and get it just the things. So what do we find from this report? As I mentioned, we did estimates of both primary and secondary contact recreation. So let's start start with primary uh, with these recreational indicators. Primarily, we used E. coli, which is a measure of fecal bacteria. We also considered chlorophyll A and cyanobacteria. The results from that work was very encouraging in that about 95% of our lakes are perfectly suitable for swimming and secondary contact recreation. We found that all of our lakes were in, were in good condition. So if you want to paddle, um, go out boating, um, our lakes are in very good condition across the state of New Hampshire. The other thing we looked at, as I mentioned, was aquatic life use. This wasn't as encouraging. We used eight different parameters to come up with this estimate. We used uh, uh, ANC, which is a, which is again something you guys do in your VLAP work. It's a measure of uh, of ability of a water's ability to resist pH change. We also use chlorine, chlorophyll A, cyanobacteria, dissolved oxygen, invasive plant species, pH, and total phosphorus. And when you take all of these uh, parameters together and look at them for each of our water bodies. Collectively, only about 9% of our lakes were in full support of aquatic life use. But what we know is that pH was a real important factor in this. And in fact, only about 16% of our lakes met our pH criteria across the state. And again, as anybody that's been in this business or been working on lakes and ponds or done any reading, know that um, acid deposition, acid rain over the course of 30 years has left us with a great legacy of impacted water bodies. And while those conditions are in are are improving, they're very slow to improve. And New Hampshire doesn't have the geology to that would support a, a quick rebound. So that's the primary driver, and we're continuing to track pH and alkalinity to see how that um, 
how that improves over time. And again, we do have another report. Um, it's it's a few years old now that looks at the trends in asset deposition around the state of New Hampshire. Now, the other thing I mentioned that we did with this information is uh, make estimates of how our lakes and ponds in New Hampshire compare to others across the region and nationally. And we did this for seven different parameters, uh, including trophic class, chlorophyll A, acid neutralizing capacity, dissolved oxygen, total phosphorus, total nitrogen, and then LDI, which is lakeshore disturbance. And here's an example plot for total phosphorus. And what you'll see here is the, the pie chart for the nation, the pie chart for the region, and we're actually in the northern Appalachian region, which is shown over here in the pink. And that includes all of New England, all of New York, and part of Pennsylvania. And these pie charts are really nice and easy to read in that it breaks it down to three primary narrative categories, good, fair, and poor, and the percentages of water bodies in each of those categories. And for this one, what you see is that nationally, about 45% of the water bodies are in poor condition for total phosphorus. Whereas in New Hampshire, we have a very small percentage of water bodies that high, have high total phosphorus concentrations. And these uh, graphs are consistent across each of the parameters. And again, it makes a nice uh, comparison of the lake conditions in New Hampshire to other areas of the uh, country. In general, I think the take home message from this were that New Hampshire lakes and ponds were less good, if that's good English, probably not, than others in the region, but better than most lakes nationally. And that most lakes in New Hampshire fell in the fair condition category for most of the parameters and that there really wasn't a high percentage of waters in New Hampshire that were in poor condition. So again, this report is posted on our website and I would encourage you to go ahead and take a look at that. Now, what you guys are probably all wanting to discuss tonight is cyanobacteria. And I am very, very happy to uh, announce that we do have a new uh, CyanoHabs program manager. Her name is Kate Hastings, and uh, here's a nice picture of her here in the foreground. Uh, after this is maybe her third or fourth day on the job that we took her out in the lake, and and she started to uh, collect some data, and she jumped right in, no doubt. Um, and she's she is uh, going to be uh, a real asset to our agency and to the Jody Connor Limnology Center. She hails from UNH, uh, has spent her entire, la entire life in the state of New Hampshire, and uh, is, is one of Dr. Haney's disciples over at UNH. So she has studied cyanobacteria um, extensively and has a lot of experience. We're really happy to bring Kate on board, and I know she's been super busy even in these first few weeks. Uh, we already have a couple of advisories out there. If you haven't checked our uh, CyanoHabs advisory page and map, I would uh, encourage you to to go ahead and and look there and and uh, and see what we have issued. But Kate's jumping uh, both feet in right away, and unfortunately. What we know and what everybody's experiencing is that these blooms are becoming a regular part of our summer for some of our water bodies. And for other water bodies, you just don't know. And we're having new water bodies every year uh, experience a bloom for the first time. And maybe other water bodies that have experienced blooms in the past don't have one. What we've learned at a minimum over the past several years is that cyanobacterial blooms are very unpredictable. But regardless, cyanobacteria blooms are part of our summer and they're here to stay and we need to figure out what to do about them. So what can I say that we are doing about them here in the Jody Connor Limnology Center? As I mentioned earlier, we did our first alum treatment in about 40 years. That was directly um, targeted at curtailing cyanobacterial blooms. And um, and we anticipate that we will be doing more alum treatments in the future. The other thing some of you may be aware of, there is a bill in the state legislature this year, and we're very hopeful that it will pass. It's House Bill 1066. 
and it begins a process by which the state can work with the public and get input from interest groups on how to deal with cyanobacteria blooms. There's two primary components to this bill. The first would require um, DES to produce a report by November or by November 2023 that looks at all possibilities on how to deal with cyanobacterial blooms, how to monitor cyanobacterial blooms, how to get information out about cyanobacterial blooms. So that report has to be done by November 2023. The other big part of this bill um, creates a, an advisory committee which runs for the same period of time that will bring a, um, a number of different interest groups together to provide that input that we'll need to make the report successful. So those are the two primary components of this bill, and I think it will really begin the process to start looking at how we deal with cyanobacteria blooms on a more formal basis in the state of New Hampshire. The other thing is we are extremely busy in our lab, and uh, as Kate and our prior uh, cyanobacteria program manager Amanda McQuaid knows, uh, we process a lot of microscopic uh, samples during the summertime to determine the severity of cyanobacteria blooms. And in fact, in 2021, we processed almost 800 microscope samples. That's a lot, and it keeps us really, really busy. We also have added regular toxin analysis, cyanotoxin analysis to the work that we do. That's to get an idea of how toxic the blooms are when they occur. These toxin analyses are done typically after the season is completed, but we use that to compare back to the cell counts that we do microscopically. And there's different types of toxins that we can do these tests on. The one that we do most of them on is called microcystin, but there's a couple others that we're able to do as well. Also in 2020, we began a new alert system, and this is a little bit less um, severe than our advisory um, that we would issue, but the new alert system was done so that we could have a more rapid response to blooms that re were reported to us either through email, via text, or phone call. And this is in cases where people see blooms around the lake, they're able to confirm a bloom either, either by uh, sending us a photograph or by submitting a sample to us, and maybe it just doesn't reach the level uh, at which we think an advisory is necessary. But we use those alerts to inform lo local lake residents, um, health officers, and just to get the word out to the local community that there is a sign of bacteria or bloom going on in the lake, but it is not severe. We also have added uh, cyanohabs histories to our lake information mapper. And if you haven't had a chance yet, all you have to do is Google Lake Information Mapper, and, and this will come up, and it's, it's an exceptional resource for New Hampshire lakes. We have a whole bunch of information on individual water bodies listed there. And if you're interested in knowing about whether a cyanobacteria bloom has occurred on a particular water body, there's a really nice, simple report now linked on those uh, on that mapper for each of the water bodies. So I would encourage you to go ahead and take a look there. And as we have in the past, we're still continuing to do daily updates to our advisory page. That's on the home page, the DES homepage. There's an advisory section at the top of the page, and that will take you to a map. And it's uh, it's sort of like Google Maps. You can scroll around and click on a particular water body and see any of the advisories. We also are doing uh, social media outlets. We use Twitter. Um, I think they're doing Instagram and um, Facebook this year as well. And we do when we do have an advisory, we issue a press release. And then lastly, um, the the position that we have that Kate Hastings is currently holding um, was a new position, and that's now dedicated to uh, the, the dealing with cyanobacteria, and that was established in 2019. So it seems like there's lots to be done, but I feel like we're also doing a lot already. Um, and I'm really happy that we're able to provide these resources to you, to the to the, uh, to the people of New Hampshire, and uh, look forward to, to continuing to advance our ability to deal with cyanobacteria blooms. Lastly, I just want to put a plug in um, for our mercury and fish tissue mercury monitoring program. Uh, hopefully the, the picture here catches your attention. 
um, but we do do uh, analysis of fish tissue to determine the amount of mercury in in their tissue. And if you don't know, mercury is uh, can be very harmful to to humans if you ingest too much. Um, and fish are a are perfect bioaccumulator of mercury. And over the years, we've already processed about 4,000 fish. And there's a link on the bottom of the page here that will take you to the, the, pa the DS page that has most of this information. It includes a report that we did, I think it was back in 2018, that summarizes all the data that we had to date. But I'm also really happy to announce that we have a brand new instrument in our laboratory this year. Uh, this is updating our older instrument that will allow us to continue to do this work. And we're really making a, a new push this year, and I think you'll see some information real soon, um, looking for volunteers to provide us that information. And uh, if you're listening to this tonight and think you might be interested, I would uh, encourage you to contact me about this program. And again, we do have uh, or will be issuing some information if you're interested in volunteering to collect some fish and bring them into us. Simple hook and line, as the picture shows here, is the way to do it. Um, you could freeze the fish and then bring them into us and then we analyze them during the winter months and can provide you in a report about the condition of the fish in your particular water body. So and um, again, the, all the, the current information is is available on our lake information mapper and um, and I would encourage you to go there to, to look at what we have or if you're interested in looking at that report that I mentioned. So with that, I've I've taken probably enough time uh, from you guys tonight, I, and I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, you guys do fantastic work. Um, I, I can't uh, express uh, my thanks to you enough for the work that you do. Uh, your your contributions are just amazing, and beyond the the VLAP reports that Sarah does such a wonderful job in creating every year. Your data goes to so many other sources, uh, including our biennial water quality assessment that gets issued to EPA. And I, I'm not sure that I've mentioned this before, um, but a good portion of the data that we use to make lake assessments come from the VLAC data that you guys collect. The status and the lake status and trends report that I mentioned earlier, that's based almost entirely on VLAP data, and that's just a great resource that sums up um, the conditions over time of our lakes in the state of New Hampshire. And then I mentioned the online lake information mapper um, that your data contributes significantly to that. And then again, the VLAP reports are a fantastic resource for your lakeside community, for your town and for yourselves. Um, there's so many other ways that this data gets used. Uh, I'd be pressed to, to list them all, but again, I thank you from the bottom of that bottom of my heart for the work that you do. Uh, we wouldn't have nearly as much data on our lakes and ponds in the state of, New state of New Hampshire wasn't for you. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. I'll put my ugly mug back on the screen. So Dave, we did have a few questions for you. Um, and before we dive into those, I'll note that uh, these slides and the recording will be available after the presentation for those who want to, for instance, follow some of the links in those slides that Dave mentioned. Um, so relative to salt, John asks how much of that salt increase is due to the expansion of I-93? That is a very, very good question. Um, the I-93 expansion was actually very, very closely monitored in terms of the uh, chloride concentrations. And in fact, because there was a number of impaired water bodies already in the watershed in which the expansion occurred, they were required to hold their loads, loads of salt and chloride um, at the current level. So it, it didn't increase uh, technically on paper the amount of chloride or road salt running into our water bodies. Um, that being said, I'm not sure that's entirely true, but they did the best they could, and they do, meaning uh, uh, NHDOT, track their salt usage very closely, and the amount of salt that they've used per highway lane mile has actually decreased, and that was 
in large part due to this work that was required as part of the I-93 expansion. Great, and then hopping over to cyanobacteria, um, Glenn was curious to learn why toxin analysis is done after the season as opposed to during the summer. Another excellent question. Uh, we do ELISA tests, which I'm not even going to try to tell you what the acronym is, but essentially the way those tests works is they come in a plate of 96 samples per plate. So it's very, very difficult to do analysis on, you know, two or three or four or five water bodies at a time. What we do is we save um, the the samples that we have in the freezer so that we're able to utilize all of the uh, test plates or test kit at one single time. The test kits run about $500 each. So that's why we wait till the end of the summer. The other thing is, um, the tests take a day or two to actually get the results. So by the time we get a sample in and process the sample, there's such delay in getting those toxin results back that they're really not that useful in real time. What we found is that the cell counts are a much quicker way, and since they are correlated to some extent to the toxin analysis, a much better way to get the word out and uh, and increase the safety to public health. Great, and then we have Jim Martell with his hand up to ask a question. Um, Jim, I believe I have unmuted your microphone if you would like to go ahead and ask your question. Uh, and if, that may not be working here. If so, please go ahead and put your question into the chat as we know that bit is working. Um, meanwhile, we had a couple of questions on the alum treatment at NIPPO. Um, one was just an, a sense of the cost estimate for that treatment. Um, you had mentioned it was very expensive. Yeah, so uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember how many acres her hectares were treated in Nipple Lake. I want to, I'm going to say 40 hectares. Uh, so it wasn't a small area. And the cost for the chemicals and the treatment alone, I was going to say was around $150,000. And a lot of those funds came directly from the Lake Association. It was matched um, by a um, a grant from NHDS through our 319 program, and that was the value of having a watershed base plan as it made them eligible for those grant funds. Great, and in follow-up, Scott asked what the potential side effects are of adding aluminum compounds to lakes. Yeah, so um, I'm just finishing up a report on the, on the project now, and that will um, definitely uh, show show uh, or talk about those potential side effects. The, the two things that we really got to um, be aware of when this type of treatment is done is the pH of the water and the amount of aluminum in the water. And and the reason for that is your the two different compounds that are added, one is an acid and one is a base. So if you add too much of one, it'll drive the pH really high. If you had too much of the other, it'll drive the pH really low. So you have to balance those very carefully. Um, you do have to do some prior research to figure out how to do that. And then sort of related to that is the aluminum compound component of things. Aluminum is toxic to aquatic life, but the toxicity of aluminum is controlled uh, pretty carefully or regulated carefully by the pH of the water. So as long as you're keeping the water within a normal pH of say six and a half to eight, the toxicity of aluminum remains relatively low. And then again, we did several things during the course of the project to reduce the potential for um, aluminum toxicity. And that was spreading the treatment out over a number of days. It was done over the course of about a month and we only did nine days of treatment in total. Uh, we also treated certain areas of the lake on any given days, and then we so the whole entire lake wasn't dosed at one time. And then actually the pattern in which the the boat that you saw in the photo there ran um, 
was sort of carefully controlled so that um, aquatic life had a chance to to uh, to avoid the plume of chemicals that were added. So it, it was kind of tricky and it did take a lot of work, um, but we were able to do it and we we did daily observations of aquatic life. We didn't see any uh, noticeable harm. We did see some fish on some larval fish, wild wild fish on one day that seemed to be affected a little bit, but uh, we didn't find a lot of mortality and we did do some minor modifications to the way the treatment was being performed that seemed to really uh, reduce those impacts. Great, so I think we have time for just one more question here um, before we'll move on to the next section. Um, Jim, I think we have successfully unmuted you if you wanted to uh, go ahead and ask that, and our apologies for the delay in that. Okay, Dave, can you hear me? I can, Jim. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> well, I was wondering if there's some work can be done uh, between DES and DOT in uh, lowering the amount of salt done on those state roads that uh, you know are near lakes and ponds i mean seems to me that's something that could be just determined by looking at a map and seeing which roads run along a lake such as at mascoma lake there's route 4a that runs right along the lake it seems to me that you know that would be a simple measure to say well you'll have to reduce the, the salt load to the lake and also Route 4. Is there some thought of doing that to try to control the uh, the salt input? Y yes, there is, and, and that was what I was talking about, the, uh, the certified salt applicator program that the state of New Hampshire DES has, and I believe that all of the DOT, um, you know, regional offices are required to go through that through that program. I, I don't know that for sure, but I, I know that was a big part of the work that was being done with DOT. So I, I can look into that a little bit more. If, if you'd like to have some more information on that, you can shoot me an email. I'm sure Sarah could get that to you and I can I can learn a little bit more about that. But I believe that they're all part of the, it, we call it the Green Snow Pro program. So, oh, cool. um, and it's, okay. it's, it's a lot of work and, and they do uh, participate in it. And uh, it's it's actually been a, a hugely successful program for us, and uh, not just for the for the state plow crews, but uh, what we found is that there's actually a lot more salt being unnecessarily applied to parking lots, and oh, this cool. and this and this Green Pro Snow program uh, provides the applicators a limited liability clause in their insurance, so that if they're applying less salt, that they don't end up getting sued. So that's well, that's that's the hook on their end. That's what they're looking for. OK, thank you. You're very welcome. OK, um, this is Sarah again, and thank you, Dave, um, for your excellent presentation. Uh, I just want to take a minute and introduce Nisa Marks, or let Nisa introduce herself. Um, so she has been moderating our chat and assisting with technical difficulties if we've had them. So um, among other things for tonight to help us, but um, I'm gonna let Nisa uh, tell you about herself and what she's going to be doing for DES. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. It's really a delight uh, to, to get to see many of your names. I look forward to meeting you out on a lake sometime soon. Um, I am the new watershed coordinator at New Hampshire DES. Uh, this is a newly re-envisioned position to really focus squarely on lakes and lake issues. Um, as you heard from Dave, and as we've been seeing in the wonderful monitoring data that you collect, um, there are a number of both perennial challenges and also some newly emerging issues on our lakes. And DES really didn't have someone to serve as a single point of contact for lake associations um, to brainstorm with you, support your work, help connect you with resources where needed, um, and then also to be able to take the step back and take a 30,000 foot big picture look 
talk uh, across the state at the issues that are um, being faced on our lakes um, and help connect uh, the wonderful rich data uh, that you all support um, with implementation projects to uh, improve water quality across the state. So that's some of what I'll be doing in this position. Um, I welcome hearing from you guys about things that are working well on your lakes or within your lake associations, um, challenges you may be having, resources that would be really helpful to you that you would welcome um, having. Um, I'm looking forward to being able to help share good ideas from one like to others across the state um, and just generally um, support uh, the work that lake associations across the state are doing. Um, Dave also mentioned cyanobacteria and uh, the bill that we are hoping the governor will sign shortly, um, forming that advisory committee at DES. Um, I'm going to be helping to support uh, the process of preparing that strategy and supporting the committee's work. Um, and so I'm also curious to hear from you guys um, what's been working well relative to how you're communicating cyanobacteria issues and, and prevention strategies uh, to your friends and your neighbors on the lakes, um, and, as well as uh, where there may be challenges and uh, where you might want additional support. So I'm going to put my contact information into the chat and uh, please don't hesitate to, to reach out at any point. Uh, and I do look forward to meeting many of you on a lake sometime in the near future. Thank you, Nisa. Um, I do anticipate that Nisa will be coming out with many of us this summer to meet you on your lake or pond. Um, so definitely introduce yourself. Um, and if you have any questions for Nisa about some of the um, emerging hot topics that we are talking about, um, please feel free to contact her. Um, so it's uh, about 7.20 and I'm willing to stay a little bit later. If you all are, I will go over um, some of what you, some of the hard work that you put in last year um, and then what we can anticipate to see for this year. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And oh, that's not the one I want, so you're going to have to wait one second because apparently I closed the other one. It's nice that your VLAP coordinator has her act together tonight. So let's see. Sarah, while you're, sorry, Sarah, while you're uh, looking through stuff there, there was a question that came in about comments of cyanobacteria blooms in the winter versus the summer and we really don't have a good sense of that um, if people are out on the ice in the winter time and see a cyanobacteria bloom please report it to us we're not out there looking for cyanobacteria blooms in the winter time um, we know they they can occur but we don't know the frequency uh, yes dave good information um and i just want to let you all know that we also had a couple of lakes do some under ice sampling this winter um, just to you know maybe see what's happening under there um, under the ice um, i think that there's more going on than we than we know um, our lakes just aren't going to sleep at when uh, during the winter i think part of that is climate related and um, the shorter ice seasons that we have and maybe less snowpack so um, I may talk about a little bit about that. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm going to go over the 2021 monitoring season, um, talk a little bit about climate and lakes, and then what's new and what to expect in 2022. Uh, so I won't take a lot of time to go over this, um, but we you can see that the total number of lakes is really pretty, it's holding pretty steady, right around 175. We have some new and some returning lakes to the program uh, in 2022, which is exciting. So um, the interest in regular water quality monitoring is growing. Um, it, in 2019, we saw 
You know, the largest number of lakes sampled and sampling events conducted, um, obviously due to COVID in 2020, that number went down. But we had a really good rebound in 2021. So still following some COVID protocols, but we saw that number um, really bounce back up in 2021. And then this year we expect, since we're back to sort of our normal number of biologist visits, uh, we really expect that number to uh, improve again and to for our total sampling, sampling events to be above 450. I anticipate closer to about 500, which is really impressive since we get all of that done in just about three months. So it's a lot of work in a little amount of time and you are just an excellent group of people to get all of this done. So it goes without saying that increases in monitoring events means increases in sample analysis and results generate, generated in our laboratory. Um, so our banner year in 2019, we saw 16,500 um, results generated, uh, which means that not only are you busy in the field collecting samples, but you know we're really busy in the lab. Um, again, we saw that decrease in 2020, a rebound in 2021 with just over 15,000 results generated. So um, I anticipate us to be up over that 16,000 mark again this year. So what do we do with all of the results? Well, Dave gave you a really good um, recap of what our bureau does with the data that you collect, which is extremely impressive. Um, and so VLAP also uses your results to look at water quality trends on an individual lake basis. Um, we are able to analyze trends at 90% of the lakes participating in VLAP. So that means those lakes that have 10 or more years, consecutive years of data collection. So that allows us to look at the long-term trends in water quality. Uh, and those trends are telling us that roughly 95% of our lakes have stable and improving trends in chlorophyll A, epilinetic phosphorus levels, and pH levels. Uh, the improving pH trends support the measured, measured recovery of New Hampshire's lakes from historical acid precipitation. Um, and we continue to see about 20% of lakes with worsening trends in lake clarity or transparency. I just moved a slide and I didn't mean to, but. Um, and so the lake clarity and transparency trends, it's not being driven by worsening algal growth. Uh, but this further supports the evidence that some of our lakes are becoming darker over time, which is a process that we refer to as lake browning. Um, supporting Dave's analysis of chloride data, about 50% of our lakes continue to exhibit worsening trends in con connectivity over time. Um, and most of, if not all, that can be attributed to road salt. And then finally, one trend that we don't really discuss much, um, but will be important as we deal with climate change and cyanobacteria in the future, is hypolimnetic phosphorus levels. So 16% of our lakes um, have worsening or increasing hypolimnetic phosphorus trends. Um, in contrast to that, only 6% of our lakes have worsening epilimnetic phosphorus trends. Uh, so this indicates that internal loads of phosphorus are increasing in our lakes over time. Uh, that's important because it's one of our primary drivers of cyanobacteria blooms. Um, Welcome my cat Cece to the show. All right, you're gonna move. All right, so as an example, so here's a look at deep spot phosphorus levels in 2021. So you can clearly see that hypolimnetic phosphorus levels increase, generally increase as the summer progresses. Um, but my question was, are hypolimnotic phosphorus levels increasing in general over time and not just uh, annually during a summer? So if you look at average summer hypolimnotic phosphorus levels, you see over time that those numbers are increasing. Uh, and the month with the greatest rate of increase in hypolimnotic phosphorus levels over time is August. So again, late summer, um, you have that anoxia at the bottom of the lake and you see hypolimnetic phosphorus levels increasing likely due to internal loads of phosphorus from lake sediments. So this in general, um, you know, we would expect to maybe start seeing an increase in cyanobacteria growth over time in our lakes as well. 
So finally, I just wanted to touch on the record rainfall that fell in most of the state in July of 2021. Uh, I'm sure there are probably or were a lot of questions regarding how it might affect water quality. In looking at data from all of the lakes combined, there wasn't really a noticeable impact on a statewide level. Um, that means that it was just very lake specific. But the one parameter where the rainfall impact was noticeable across the board really was pH. So this graphic represents the average monthly tributary and deep spot pH levels for all the lakes combined compared with monthly rainfall totals just in Concord, New Hampshire. So in June, uh, rainfall was actually below average. Um, July rainfall in Concord was just over 13 inches. Uh, so this set a record for July and August was right around an average for the month in terms of rainfall. So the record July rainfall did cause a decrease in pH and surface waters. Uh, and that's likely due to the just the weak buffering capacity of wa our waters, as Dave mentioned as well. So this isn't always the case, and it can be very dependent upon the characteristics of storm events combined with the geology of the area. So this graphic really sort of makes that case. So looking at the average summer pH from all of our lakes, it's really fairly consistent, and it's not always dependent upon rainfall. So this graphic also is just using the rainfall totals from one weather station, so that's Concord. And so we may see better correlation between rainfall and pH if we looked at data from multiple locations. Um, but I really think the bigger picture or the bigger takeaway um, from this graphic is the increased variability in summer rainfall totals since 2006. Um, so I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. So next, I'm just going to talk about um, what to expect in 2022, um, some clim climate predictions, and then water quality predictions. So I really want to encourage you to continue to submit ice in and ice out information to us. So this data allows us to better, under better understand how the changing climate is affecting periods of ice cover. This can have implications not just on water quality, but as also winter recreation on our lakes. So as you can see here, um, this past winter, we saw an average of 13.2 weeks of ice cover. Uh, that was one week less than we saw in 2020 and 2021. So it really appears that we're experiencing a rapid decline in ice, ice cover just since 2017. So please, I, I encourage you to continue su to submit the information because I really think it's important um, as we take a look at our lakes in the future. So first, we're going to look at some precipitation information. So here we see on the left-hand side the percent of normal precipitation received between November 2021 and April 2022. And on the right-hand side, we see the precipitation departure from normal. So the tan and brown and orange areas mean less precipitation, while the green areas mean more. Uh, the takeaway really here is that it's just been a little bit drier than normal for most of the state as we head into the summer sampling season. Although this might be a little difficult to see, um, it's been dry, but it's been warm. Um, on the left-hand side, we see the average air temperature departure from normal between November 2021 and January 2022. And on the right-hand side, the departure between February through April 2022. So between November and January, we saw average air temperatures were within a normal range. However, from February through April, we saw temperatures were between one and three degrees warmer on average. So last year, we touched on the fact that New Hampshire get, is getting warmer and it's also getting wetter um, and how those conditions are affecting things in our lakes, such as water temperature, algal and cyanobacteria growth, as well as dissolved oxygen, nutrients, ice cover, growing seasons and chloride levels. So what might we expect in 2022? Um, so NOAA is forecasting above average temperatures in June, July, and August. And equal chances of above or below average precipitation. Um, so again, I'm going to 
talk about this graphic, um, this average summer rainfall in Concord, and the summer period here is June through August. Um, so you, you really see within the last 12 years or so, we, we're starting to see somewhat of a cyclical pattern with drought conditions occurring about every three to five years um, within the most recent two decades. So I expect that we might see slightly above average rainfall this summer, but less than what we experienced last summer, um, which really is hard to predict and I might be totally wrong. So um, we'll see how it goes. But really the takeaway from this graphic is just that, that variability that we're starting to see in summer rainfall and how our lakes actually might respond to that. So what might this mean for our lakes this summer? Um, well, we're already receiving reports about cyanobacteria blooms and we've already issued advisories for those. Um, we're also getting reports of filamentous algal growth um, and it looks like it's gonna be a pretty good year for that as well. Uh, so ice out was earlier. Uh, most of our lakes experienced a shorter period of ice cover. So as we know, earlier ice out generally, generally means longer growing seasons for aquatic plants and algae cyanobacteria as well. Uh, it also means that thermal stratification in our deep lakes will set up earlier. Uh, this usually leads to extended periods of anoxia in hypolimnetic waters uh, that could have a detrimental effect on internal phosphorus loading, uh, again, which could uh, lead to an increase in cyanobacteria blooms later in the summer. Um, with temperatures already in the 90s um, in May, be on the lookout for cyanobacteria growth earlier this season, um, particularly if heat waves follow storm events. So um, as always, you really are our eyes and ears out there. We tell you that all the time, but, but that's the truth. Um, so if you see anything unusual, please don't hesitate to contact us. All right, so what's new in 2022? Um, so while this technically isn't brand new, um, we do have a sort of new to us sonar unit uh, for those interested in updating their lake bathymetry information. Um, so if you want to borrow this unit, you should con contact me. Um, we can sign it out to you. We have a video on how to use that on YouTube, but we also have written instructions as well. And then I'm really, really trying to remind you um, that we have the option of a virtual biologist visit. So um, instead of an in-person biologist visit, the virtual visits um, will be offered just for those groups that just need a really brief refresher before sampling. Uh, so the visits are designed to be about 30 minutes or less, um, and you can just ask really specific questions um, about sampling procedures or lake health, um, anything that you, you wanna talk about prior to heading out on the lake. Um, and you can schedule your virtual visit through the PickTime app um, or the PickTime software, just like you would with a normal biologist visit. Okay, so this is the end of our updates. Does anyone have any questions at this time? Okay. So I went through that really quickly, but I just sort of, I don't want to go Sarah, too, there's too a, late. There's a yep. quick question here about sharing the presentations. Mm -hmm. um, yes. From the folks down at Island Pond. Yes. Um, all of this will be recorded and I can also put the presentations on um, the website or YouTube as well. Okay, great. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so um, really uh, what, we, what we're what we here for and what we want to do is, is recognize all of the hard work um, that you all put in. Um, this is our favorite part of sort of our annual get together um, workshop webinar. Um, it's the Volunteer Luminologist and Secchi Disc Awards. Um, you know, understand that you really all deserve the recognition for your tire, tireless efforts to monitor our our lakes and ponds. Um, we're, New Hampshire's really fortunate to have such an amazing group of dedicated individuals um, and lake associations that really 
take the lead um, and to preserve and protect our, our valuable water resources. So without your assistance, um, the, the work that we do would not be possible. So I just wanna give a thank you to all of you um, that are here tonight, but also everybody that couldn't join us. So each time uh, you're out on your lake, uh, you're collecting water quality samples or sur surveying for aquatic plants, exotic species, you're conducting oxygen and temperature profiles, collecting ice out data or sampling under the ice now, um, you're monitoring for cyanobacteria. Um, you really are um, conducting the role of a true limnologist. Um, and our volunteer limnologist wards are based upon our years of service in VLAP, years of service in some of our other monitoring programs, such as weed watchers or lake hosts, um, involvement with advanced sampling techniques, involvement in community education and outreach um, about lake water quality and watershed management issues, and then involvement in watershed management and planning. Um, which I, you know, pretty much all of you have been at some point um, or will be. So in 2022, um, our Volunteer Limnologist Award recipient is um, Mark and Pat Allen from Sand Pond and Marlow. Again, you know, another unsung hero. Um, they've been at the VLAP helm for over 16 years, um, and they've actively been involved in lake association and lake management for over 30 years. Um, so, so they really are like naturals when it comes to monitoring and um, consistently collect month monthly samples from the lake and tributaries. Um, They've conducted several advanced bracketing sampling events, really aimed at pollution source detection within the watershed, um, which really has resulted in improved tributary water quality conditions. Um, they've consistently observed the lake for any signs of exotic species, um, conducted cyanobacteria monitoring, um, and consistently communicate um, with DES. Um, for this reason and many more, uh, we want to recognize you um, and thank you, Mark and Pat. And next is our 2022 Secchi Disc Award. Um, here you see uh, Dave and Marge Thorpe from Lake Wickwas. I um, gave them their their 2020 Secchi Disc Award last summer. I was fortunate enough to be able to go out there to do that. Um, so the 2022 Secchi Disc Award recipient is uh, the Tucker Pond Improvement Association in Salisbury, New Hampshire. Um, so you see up on the upper right hand corner here is um, a cyanobacteria bloom um, that started in 2019. Um, so after the pond experienced this, this horrible bloom, um, they really um, took up this cause and they met with several of our NHDES programs to better understand cyanobacteria, lake ecology, and lake management. And they also did a lot of their own research into cyanobacteria. Um, they raised funds to hire a consultant to review their historical water quality data, make recommendations on additional sampling and future management efforts. And they then decided to conduct monthly water quality sampling from April through October, um, which included tributary storm event sampling. And then they experimented with these biochar mats in a tributary to better understand if the mats were effective at reducing nutrient loading from the tributary. Um, and as a small lake association, they really truly went above and beyond in trying to protect Tucker Pond for generations to come. So congratulations, um, and we truly, truly appreciate their efforts um, and recognize the value of those efforts. All right, so if you would like to nominate one of your fellow volunteers for an award, please request a nomination form from me, um, and we look forward to 
our 2023, announcing our 2023 Limnologist and Psyche Disc Award winners at next year's uh, workshop. Could be a webinar, might be in person. Um, and with that, um, I'd really just, I'd like to leave you with Marge Thorpe's Don't Pee in My Pond. Um, and we can answer any questions that people might have. So is any, are people still with us? Here. I will stop sharing my screen. Yo, sir, you still have 40 people here that are listening to you. So oh, you've, excellent. You've, you've kept them tuned in. Oh, for good. Sure. I'm glad. Yep. I hope they enjoyed my cat. I, you know, it's, your cat it's a good was night. lovely. Yeah. Yep. That's yep. Great. That's a good night. Um, so it's, Thank you, everyone. Um, that concludes our webinar tonight. But if you have any questions or just want to reach out and say hello, um, I look forward to hearing from you and seeing you this summer. I know I have a lot of you already scheduled for in-person biologist visits, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and again, NISA is available if you have have questions about some of the other emerging issues and Dave is always available um, to talk and chat with you. So. And thank you all so much for your incredibly valuable work. It provides such a wonderful overview of lake health across the state. All right, so nice to see everyone tonight. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. If we um, inspired any additional questions, feel free to contact us via email.